I, you know, so sometimes I have, I have lots of reasons for, for why I sort of wanted to do this novel. But um, let me just tell you a little bit about the days after 9-11 um, in my apartment in, um, in, in New York. Lots of things were happening, you know. My kids were afraid of, uh, of fire trucks and, or, and, and sirens. And, um, there was a car parked outside our, our, um, our apartment block. And the, on, the, on September the 12th, it got a parking ticket. And on September the 13th, it got a parking ticket. But on September the 14th, it started to get flowers. And um, so everybody knew what had happened. So there were all these moments in New York that, 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 that were sort of amazing to me, uh, that everything had meaning. It was almost like it was a level ground of, me, of meaning. You'd walk down the street and, and, and you see a firefighter that was, it was intimately connected with everything. And um, on my windowsill there would be dust, and every day the dust would come back because the, the, the was blowing through the city. And you could run your finger a, across the dust, and you'd have to wonder what it was that was there. Was it, um, you know, a bit of a concrete pillar? Was it a bit of somebody's resume? Uh, was it, you know, a file folder? Could it have been somebody's eyelash? I mean, these were the things that 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 that, that hit me. But as a novelist, I wasn't sure. How to get at it until I thought about um, I read Paul Auster's um, essay about uh, Philippe Petit, and um, I thought, wow, that's an amazing act of creation in opposition to that 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 incredible act of destruction that had happened. And as the years went by, I kept thinking about this image, and I also was moving towards a moment of uh, trying to move towards a moment of grace, because like like a lot of people in the United States and all over the world. I was embarrassed for what had happened in the name of 9-11 for all those people in other parts of the world, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and New York, and Madrid, and London, and anywhere else. We were all affected. So I wanted to write a novel that's a polyphonic novel that talks about the ordinary people really on the ground and use the title of Walker as a metaphor uh, for where we are. So um, I'm going to read to you from, we're going to do two women's stories. In fact, it's really a book about, about women, I think. Um, one is a 38-year-old um, prostitute in the Bronx, and we'll read from later, and Joe will sing a song about her. Uh, but the first one I'm going to read from, just in English, is um, a woman who lives on Park Avenue, and uh, her son went off to Vietnam as a computer operator, and he died out there. And she's uh, she's part of a grief group, really, um, where all these women, mostly working class women, uh, are get together to talk about their boys. It's called Miro Miro on the Wall because um, she has a one Miro on the, on the wall. And this is just the opening bit, and then I'll hop through and read a little bit more. From outside, the sounds of Park Avenue, quiet, order, control, still the nerves jangle in her. Soon she will receive the women. The prospect ties a small knot at the base of her spine. She brings her hands to her elbows, hugs her forearms. The wind ruffles the light curtains at the window, alicorn lace, handmade, tatted with silk trimmings, never much for French lace. She would have preferred an ordinary fabric, a, a light voile. The lace was Solomon's idea long ago, long ago. The stuff of marriage, the good glue. He brought her breakfast this morning on the three-handled tray. Poisson, lightly glazed, chamomile tea, a little slice of lemon on the side. He even lay down on the bed in his suit and he touched her hair, kissed her before he left. Solomon, wise Solomon, briefcase in hand, off downtown. The slight waddle in his step, the clack of his polished shoes on the marble floor, his low growl of goodbye, not mean, just throaty. Sometimes it strikes her, there is my husband. There he goes, same way he's been going for 31 years. And then a sort of silence interrupted. The drifting sounds, the snap of the lock, the dim bell, the elevator boy. Good morning, Mr. Soderbergh. The whine of the door, the clang of the machinery, the soft murmur of descent, the clanging stop at the lobby below, the rondelay of the cables rising. She pulls the curtains back and peeps out the window once more. 
catches sight of the flap end of Solomon's grey suit as he disappears into a taxi. The little bald head dips, the slam of yellow into the traffic in a way. He does not even know about her visitors. She will tell him sometime, but not yet, no harm. Perhaps this evening, at dinner, candle and wine. Guess what, Solomon? And he settles in a chair, four poised. Guess what? A slight sigh from him. Just tell me, Claire, how you have had a long day. Nimble, out of her nightdress, her body in a full-length mirror, a little pale and puckered, but she can still stretch out of it. She yawns, hands high in the air, tall, still thin, jet black hair, a single streak of badger grey from the temple. Fifty-two years old, she passes a damp cloth over her hair and brushes it with a wooden comb, turns her head sideways and presses it lengthways against her palm, tangled at the split ends, time for a trim. She cleans out the comb and dumps the strands in a foot-flipped garbage can. They say the hair of the dead still grows, takes on a life of its own, down there with all the other detruitous tissues, tubes of lipstick, toothpaste tops, allergy pills, eyeliner, heart medicine, youth, nail clippings, dental floss, aspirin, grief. But how is it that the grey hairs are never the ones to come out? In her twenties, she had hated the badger streak when it appeared overnight, dyed it, hid it, chopped it, but now it defines her, the elegant swift ray of grey, sideways from the temple, a road in my hair do not overtake. Things to do, hurry, hurry, toilet, toothbrush rub, a light swish of makeup, some blush, a little eyeliner and a lipstick dab. Never one to fuss with makeup. At the dresser she pauses, bra and panties in simple beige, her favourite dress, aqua and green silk screen with a shellfish motif, A-line, sleeveless, just above the knee, bows on the slits, zip behind, fashionable and feminist at the same time, not too fancy or show-offy but contemporary, modest, good. She hitches the hem a little higher, extends her foot. Legs that glisten, said Solomon, years ago. She told him once that he made love like a hangman, erect but dead. A joke she had heard at a Richard Pryor concert. Okay, we're gonna.